Now, he would re-engineer an everlasting legacy in the name of absolute power, his own. From the ruins of Constantinople would rise one of the world's most magnificent churches that would become the center for a new religion and a monument to Byzantine engineering. Legend says that a Byzantine princess who married an Italian nobleman in the 11th century introduced the table fork to Europe. 532 AD, Emperor Justinian has just survived the Nika riots, but the heart of the Byzantine Empire lay in ruins. Re-energized, Justinian would reassert his power and rebuild the capital in the name of God and himself. What Justinian did after his imperial army put down the riot was to immediately begin to refurbish the city and, and proclaim to the citizens that he was in control and that everything was right in the Roman Empire. Now we remember Justinian not because he was ruthless, but we remember the period of Justinian because he has left us such an incredible architectural legacy. Justinian's first priority was to rebuild the city's main cathedral, called the Church of Holy Wisdom. We know it today as the Hagia Sophia. Justinian appointed two Byzantine architects, Isidorus and Anthemius, to design the church. Both were professors of mathematics and physics, skilled in theory, but with no real construction experience. The architects of, of Hagia Sophia were not the standard architects of the day. They, for better or worse, were professors. We professors sometimes don't have the most uh, sound practical knowledge. But the far-sighted Justinian gave them a free hand with only two demands. Build it as quickly as possible and make it unlike anything else on Earth. Construction began a scant six weeks after the Nika riots. It took years to put together building teams to bring together all of the building materials that were needed for a great project in the empire. Justinian did it practically instantly. Isidorus and Anthemius's design for the cathedral was revolutionary in concept and unprecedented in scale. They set out to create the largest dome ever built, 100 feet across. They began by using an architectural device first attempted by the Romans, but never fully achieved. It was called the pendentive. The first step, construct four massive arches on which the dome would rest. Next, the pendentives, rounded triangles that connect the dome's circular base to the square base below and distribute its weight evenly among the four arches. By adding smaller semi-domes, an even larger area would be created. Using pendentives, Justinian's architects were able to construct a gigantic dome that appears to hover in mid-air. The dome rises 184 feet, 30 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty. The nave over which the dome hung would be a massive open space measuring 229 feet by 245 feet. There were 100 teams of workmen, each with 100 men, with half of them working on the north side of the building, half of them working on the south side of the building, and competing to uh, create the great building. A church of unprecedented proportions grew up magically almost magically, faster than any kind of construction at that time on that scale. Hagia Sophia was dedicated in 537 AD, less than six years after the first stones were laid. Justinian was very proud of his church, as he should be. It was a great idea. It was a great conceptual plan. The implementation of that plan, the actual structure, was risky. A more experienced or pragmatic builder would have seen that trying to build a dome of this size with the materials given in a short amount of time would have been dicey at best. Before the construction was even finished, the four piers hold up the arches started to buckle and collapse. 20 years later, an earthquake happens, 
boom, whole dome comes in. Now, Isidorus the Younger, the nephew of the original Isidorus that built it, addressed the flaws in the dome, had to reconstruct it. One of the flaws, most important one, is that he raised the pitch of the dome because more vertical load of a higher dome will drive the weight into the ground, which is good to support. A short, squatty dome with horizontal load, drive the weight sideways, and kaboom, the dome falls in. So Isidorus raises the dome 21 feet, Boom, and voila, you got the dome you see today. Hagia Sophia was known for more than just its novel design. Even the columns were elaborately adorned with monograms of the emperor and his empress. We are never allowed to forget that this is the great achievement of Justinian and Theodora. Emperor Justinian had created a centerpiece for Christianity and further solidified Constantinople as the capital of the Christian world. He got an architect that was gonna make a grand statement. And a grand statement was made. The largest church in Christendom, the greatest dome space in the world until the Renaissance. He got a building that dwarfed any of the great baths of ancient Rome or any of the great temples of the ancient world. By the end of his reign, the Byzantine Empire had grown to its greatest size encompassing Syria and Palestine, Asia Minor, Italy, Greece, and southward throughout North Africa and Egypt. But the Byzantine people would pay the price of expansion. Justinian's near constant military campaigning, combined with his zeal to rebuild Constantinople, virtually bankrupted the Byzantine Empire. The empire really never recovers from the megalomania of Justinian. It's perhaps fitting that the dome of Hagia Sophia collapses. Uh, it's as if Justinian, as he is overextending the political boundaries of the empire, he's also overextending um, the uh, architecture as well. For three centuries after Justinian's death, a series of emperors would rule over a shrinking empire. But through the chaos, Constantinople stood secure and in the 10th century, the Byzantines would once again rise in a blaze of military glory, led into battle with fearsomely engineered weapons and by the finest military mind ever to wear the crown. According to legend, Constantinople boasted a collection of sacred Christian relics, including the true cross and John the Baptist's head. The year is 1000 A.D., the end of the first millennium of the Common Era. The force of Europe now lies in the north with France and Germany and the Holy Roman Empire. While here in Constantinople in the east, the Byzantines have survived wars with Visigoths, Persians, Avars, and Arabs, and weathered a very disheartening period in the 700s called Iconoclasm, where they have smashed most of their art. But the Byzantines are on the rebound now, and by 1014, they are poised to reconquer the entire Balkan Peninsula from the Danube River all the way to Greece. The man at the helm of the Byzantines' comeback was Basil II, a man of the people. Basil was the most brilliant military mind the Byzantines ever produced. He was a emperor that did not sit back and enjoy the luxuries of the palace. He went out campaigning every season, leading the Byzantine armies against the foes. He was seen to be a soldier's emperor. But there's no doubt he ranks as a highly competent, very able, very intelligent, very versatile military leader, as well as a good ruler. Basil's greatest enemy was Tsar Samuel, who ruled Bulgaria, a Slavic kingdom vying for control of the Balkan Peninsula. In 986, a decade into his reign, Basil suffered a devastating defeat at the hands of Samuel's army. The first time he marched north, he was only 18, I think. He might have been a bit younger. And he walked, he walked into an ambush, basically. Humiliated, Basil swore revenge on the Bulgarian nation. That revenge would take a quarter century to unfold. In the meantime, his defeat emboldened his Byzantine rivals. After crushing a series of revolts within his empire, Basil turned his attentions outward to restoring lost imperial lands. Determined to regain Byzantine's glory, 
he had ordered his engineers to design a new model of a deadly siege weapon, the trebuchet. The trebuchet's design was based on simple principles. Using ropes, operators cocked a wooden arm outfitted with a sling and stone. The front and sides of the wooden frame were covered in fresh animal skins to protect it from flaming arrows. You'd have your axle and your pivoting sling because of the disparity between the short end on one side of the axle and the long end on the other, you'd maximize the velocity in the swing. So you could throw substantial weights considerable distances. But Basil II did nothing by half measures. The trebuchet his engineers designed could hurl stones weighing more than 400 pounds and took a staggering force to operate, 400 men. With the world's finest troops and largest siege craft, the Byzantine army was unstoppable. And after years on the battlefield, Basil had developed a creed of ferocity and discipline among his men. He has a reputation of being harsh but fair. And of course, if the soldiers believe in their leader, they'll fight better and more effectively. He forbade anyone from breaking ranks and lectured them on the need for readiness at all times. His force could move with lightning speed across all types of terrain. Finally, in the year 1001, Basil decided it was time to head back to Bulgaria and clean up unfinished business. He then turns his attention back to Bulgaria and spends the next 15 years basically solidly campaigning year on year on year, gradually destroying the Bulgars' infrastructure, ravaging the countryside, destroying the economy. Tsar Samuel would soon realize the scope of Basil's fury. Samuel had been the only man to beat Basil in battle, and for that distinction, he would pay dearly. On July 29th in the year 1014, Basil launched a surprise attack, conquering the Bulgarian army, capturing 14,000 men. His revenge would be brutal. He blinded all of them, leaving every 100th man with one eye to lead the rest back to Bulgaria. When Samuel saw his ragged and mutilated army, he collapsed, and two days later, he died. It's one thing to execute all of these people. It's another thing to send them back to the country where their countrymen, in some ways, have to take care of all these people. So they become a, a kind of permanent liability to the society. The cruel victory earned the emperor control of the Balkans and the moniker Basil the Bulgar Slayer. In 1025 AD, when Basil died, the Byzantines were at the pinnacle of their power, but the empire was left rudderless and vulnerable to struggles within. In subsequent times, the empire needed a great general like Basil II. They didn't have one. In 1453, the Ottomans unleashed a new weapon on Constantinople's mighty land walls. In the end, Brick and stone were no match for cannon fire. Gunpowder and cannon changed the rules of war. Byzantium, Constantinople was built for a system of fighting that was obsolete by the 15th century. After 1,100 years, Constantinople's fortified walls were finally breached. Constantinople was now Istanbul. The Byzantine Empire had ended, but its innovation and engineering feats stand today as a testament to the magnificent civilization, one that borrowed from Rome's chapter in the Book of Great Empires and then added its own. What's fascinating about the Byzantine Empire is we tend to talk about empires in terms of their political might. With the Byzantine Empire, we have to understand it as a cultural power. It was a highly sophisticated intellectual culture. The Greek monks, Greek priests, were interested in ancient literature. They preserved ancient text. It is often said that the fall of Constantinople with the books going to the West is what 